Hello, my name is Phil Warwick and I'm a teacher and teacher trainer. I work with Pearson Education and I've been teaching for over 25 years. During my career I've taught in many countries. Uh, I started in Italy, I've taught in Brazil and Argentina and now I currently work in a small private language school in Brno and I go over to the UK where I'm an academic coordinator for a large summer school. In between, I'm very happy to do these training courses for Pearson and it's great to be back in Tbilisi. I'm going to give you a session today for an hour and a half uh, just to revise a little bit. I think a good teacher never stops learning. Uh, hopefully when we go through this situation, uh, you'll be able to ask me questions. We've got quite a small group, so don't be shy if I go too quickly. I thought we'd start with a little recap. General methodology. So uh, we're going to use oh, we're going to use this uh, a little bit of information from the Pearson book, Language Leader. I don't know if you know this book at all. Yeah. Uh, let's start by getting you to uh, complete that sentence three different ways. I'd like you to decide for yourself. What does a successful lesson mean for you? And maybe work with the person behind you. Yeah. Think of three different ways to finish it. Interaction with the teacher. Interaction is important, yes. Objectives of the lesson are fulfilled. Objectives are fulfilled? Yeah. When we have results, we have results. Like this, uh, people in love. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's. So I think, I think we've got the, the objectives. Sometimes, for some classes, it's just there wasn't a major incident. I survived. Yeah? I always get bored with doing exactly the same thing. So, uh, and, and I think a lot of us have been teaching for more than 20 years. And we don't, they, they talk about experience in two different ways. Is it one year's experience repeated 20 times, or is it actually a development process? And I think the fact that you're here today suggests that you want to develop, you want to change, you want to try new things. What are the two oldest methods? If we go back hundreds of years, what were the, the first two methods of teaching a foreign language? Translating. Grammar translation, mm -hmm. yeah. And what was the other one at the other diametrically opposed? If we talk, if we go back to ancient classical history, where we look at the Roman Empire, and they had the Greek slaves, and the Greek slaves were tutors, or even just a couple of hundred years ago, where the um, the English people would go on the grand visit, they go to the continent and they travel around and they might make a little bit of money tutoring. In these cases, you had a, a teacher whose mother tongue was different to the students. Native speaker. Native speaker. And there have been native speakers for, for thousands of years. So the native speakers didn't use the grammar translation method because they, they, they didn't know the, the, the language of the students. They used what's called a a natural approach. That's where the, uh, the language of the classroom is the target language. <coughs> and when the students didn't understand something, they'd use, you know, this is a rock, they'd use realia, or they'd use some, some sort of thing. So these two were the, the two major uh, approaches. And then, of course, technology came into it. Uh, after the Second World War, well, the cassette, the recorder, it, it came, it was invented I think in the 1920s, but it wasn't really available until the 1940s. And um, after the Second World War, you had a lot of policing by America, by Russia, by, by Britain, and they had to look after different countries and they had to deal with lots of different languages. So they needed their soldiers to learn language very quickly. And they learned it because they actually had a method of recording 
the target language. And they, they still have a center in America where you have these huge language laboratories where you just listen to excerpts of languages and you repeat what you hear. And, and this structuralist dealing with chunks, you're talking about phrase book language, yeah? So the first idea of functional approach, how to order food in a restaurant, yeah? How to tell someone not to cross the minefield or something, those sorts of things came out with the audio-lingual approach. And I suppose it became commercially very popular in the 60s. Because then, then it, was, it, it was available to, to, to most things. Ah, no, we're talking about the we're talking about the 70s here. So I'm sure I'm sure what you've got is a little diagram. And if we have, for example, the teacher here and the students here, uh, any activity would start off like this. Yeah. Basically, the teacher would present something and the students would listen. Mm -hmm. And then you go into a little bit of controlled practice. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, it would be left to the students to do things. Yeah, It would be sort of uh, production. And then, of course, in America, we have these holistic approaches. Uh, and I think for holistic approaches, You've got things like the silent way. Do you know a guy called Cousinaire? Basically, he used them for mathematics. So what you had was a one piece of wood, and then you had a different color for two, and a different color for three or four. And um, the silent way was using these little pieces of wood, these Cousinaire rods, <coughs> to get the students to, uh, to speak English, but without the teacher giving much presentation. The teacher gives the target language, and the teacher says it's OK for the students to be confused. I'll keep on repeating until the students get it. And when the students get it, and of course because there might be a period of, what's going on? I don't understand it. But when the students get it, it's more fixed than, than actually explaining everything. And of course, the silent way works really well, even now, with beginners. Community language learning uh, was for a unilingual class, like the type of classes that you teach. The students would all be in a circle, and they'd have a major discussion in the target language, in English. Yes, but if the students wanted to know what to say, they could ask how to say it in Georgian. So they'd whisper it, someone would tell them from the translation, and then they'd be able to say it in English. And that, so, so they could use Georgian as a resource, or the, the, the mother tongue as a resource. James Ashton? TPR? What does TPR mean? James Ashton, total physical response. Total physical response. Showing understanding through some sort of physical gesture, or it's been developed from some sort of um, response, simple response mechanism. Let's do a, a simple TPR activity. We'll do another one a little bit later, but a simple TPR activity, uh, it involves you saying two words. One word is ring. Can you say ring? Ring. 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 Mm -hmm. And the other one is buzz. Buzz. Ring. Ring. Buzz. 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 It's very simple. I'm going to say a few statements. If you agree with my statement, say ring. Mm -hmm. If you disagree with my statement, mm -hmm. today is Monday. 
Rain. 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 It's the morning. Rain. Rain. We teach English. Rain. We don't. No. Ah. <laughs> we teach English. <laughs> Not we're teaching English. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like teaching. I'm happy with my salary. I sometimes start off a lesson, even now, with a little bit of ring and buzz, and I'll just give them some, some sort of lead-in. Suggestopedia. Invented in Bulgaria. Uh, super learning. You're dream, you just get just while you dream, you get some. Yeah, the, 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 the learning environment is incredibly important. So you can come into a, a room. Uh, they suggest that there are very comfortable chairs. You sit down on the comfortable chairs. You close your eyes. You hear a little bit of music, maybe Baroque music. And then the teacher, at a certain uh, level of intonation, says the words that are going to be part of the focus of that lesson. When you start a Suggestopedia course, you have a new personality. So if I was learning Georgian, in my Suggestopedia course, I'm not Phil, a teacher trainer from England, I will be Timor, uh, a taxi driver in Tbilisi or something. I'd invent a new role for myself. So when I made a mistake, it's not Phil making a mistake, or Phil being an idiot, it's, it's Timor from, from Tbilisi being an idiot, so I, I feel a little bit more comfortable. And suggested Peter, there aren't many. It was very popular in Germany in the 70s and 80s. I think it was quite popular in the Soviet Union, yeah, as well. Uh, communicative language teaching. The fact that uh, suddenly, language is not a content-based subject, it's actually you're learning a language to communicate. And that was an important shift. We don't have to analyze the language to a certain degree, we just have to learn some speech acts, we have to learn how to apologize, we have to learn how to suggest things. And then they developed that a little bit further, about five or six years down the line, and this was very much a UK thing. Uh, and of course they said, well, we can divide communication into fluency and accuracy. And of course this idea of uh, you need to make mistakes in order to improve your fluency. And when you're taking a test, yeah, a test, you lose points if you make mistakes because they're focused on accuracy. Task-based learning. What's that? Test, what you want teach, teach, test. Test, teach, test. Um, it's the spring holiday in the Czech Republic, I mentioned. My family, I have two small children. My wife is a, a language teacher, of course. Um, they're on holiday at the moment in the mountains, and I'm here in Georgia. My wife isn't so happy with the amount of traveling I do. So I think it's really important when I come home that I bring her something, or I do something, so she can see what, what, why I travel. So I'd like you very briefly, in 30 seconds or less, to think of three things. Either something I can buy and take back from Georgia, or something I can do when I come back home to help my, my wife out, or something, uh, somewhere I can go with my family when I come. So I want three things. Something to bring back from Georgia, somewhere I can go, something I can do. Talk to your partner, I'll give you 30 seconds, see if you can think of three things. Any ideas? What's the question? Kajapori and Vague Kajapori. You like? 
I do, yes. yes. To bring back some souvenirs or photos. So they were looking at the episode of Jumbo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Learn to cook something Georgian and do it. Oh, yeah. okay. Teach some Georgian words. <laughs> All right, teach some Georgian words. <laughs> to prove you were here. Absolutely. Very difficult. I've forgotten the Georgian words I learned last time. Okay. And when you say how you missed her. Uh, that's important. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and the final thing, somewhere I can go when I go back. To get on the no Jordan restaurants in Antigua. In Prague there is. In Prague there is. I didn't bring it. There's one in Prague. Okay, so I gave you a task and you completed the task. Now, what language did you use to complete the task? Do you remember? What, what language did you use? Okay, so, so I heard, I heard either imperatives or infinitives or noun clauses, noun phrases. This group gave me something different. Does anyone remember what this group gave me? We suggest. They said we suggest. They said we suggest. So that was a perfect task to give suggestions. The lexical approach by Michael Lewis, learning words in chunks, started to become more popular in the 90s. If you teach business English, you see business English books like Intelligent Business don't have such a traditional grammar as general courses. They have more chunks, how to do this, how to negotiate, how to uh, present, and chunks of language, and there's the lexical approach for you. And of course, the way that grammar was used. Grammar was used more for functional, so you had lexical grammar. Uh, we have, how many pure modals do we have in English? Model. Pure models. So, so for example, I model verbs and modal words. Modal verbs, modal auxiliary verbs is what I want. How many do we have that, that will go in there? There are nine. There are nine. Yeah. There are nine. There are nine. So, so can, could, will, would, shall, should, must, may, might. Yeah. So there are nine. Well, any pure modal has two basic strands of meaning. An extrinsic meaning, which is linked to possibility, likelihood, probability, yeah? And an intrinsic meaning, which is different. So, for example, can, obviously we can talk about possibility with can, what else can we talk about, about with can? Ability. 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 Yeah, ability. I can I can I can speak English. I can't speak Georgian. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. Now, can has ability. Are there any restrictions grammatically? No, well no. Let's just talk about ability. Let's just talk about ability. Uh, It's not true, unfortunately. I wish it was. I can play the piano. I can play the piano. If I wanted to say, since I was a kid, can I say that? I'd have to change can to use I, I have been able to. And so this is where the grammatical approach came in, it was saying, let's focus the grammar on the can-do statements, on what you can do, and let's have a more streamlined grammar and a lexical grammar. And that was the, the grammatical approach that's been around since the 90s. Howard Gardner, multiple intelligences, yeah? Kinesthetic learners, visual learners, 
lateral learners, yeah. and the fact that we need to get students to do different things in order to, 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 to find out what works best for them. Uh, I've been very happy with some of the teachers and university lecturers that have attended these training sessions. They're always happy to participate. Uh, Georgians are very friendly people. They seem to be very active in the classrooms, uh, but they don't seem to have had an awful lot of outside help in terms of developing their teaching careers. How many le new lexical items? Well, it depends, Very doesn't it? <laughs> but it's <laughs> less than we think. Yeah. Five, seven. 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 They say teenagers, strangely enough, are supposed to be the best. It's seven, give or, give or take two. And we're talking about new items here. Obviously, we might still be recycling lots of old items in the lesson. So, how often should you recycle language? As much as possible. Yeah? A little, very often. Best time to do it? Beginning, end of lessons, more memorable. The middle bit is a bit harder. Warm-ups. Warm-ups, yes. Warm-ups, yes. Yeah, yeah. Have a look at this. Uh, what's the topic? Yeah, so we've got, we got medicine. And again, I told you I'd be frustrated uh, with the vocabulary. And of course, in a, good, in a good teacher's book, and this comes from Language Leader, you have a little bit of text so you get the students to see how the words are being used. You give them a context they can understand. You can use this for things like consciousness raising. Introducing you, Lexis, I think it's easier to start from a feeling of, of knowledge, something they know, and then you move from something they know to something that they don't know. <coughs> um, you slowly build up stuff. Scaffolding. <laughs> Scaffolding is being able to build up. I'll, I'll give you a very short vocabulary lesson. Okay? So, um, which country in Europe drinks more beer than anyone else? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, in terms of uh, the amount of beer that's consumed, maybe Germany, but in terms of the amount of beer per person, Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Uh, unfortunately, though, England is not so far behind. Yeah? And we have a culture in England of drinking beer in pubs. Yes. And of course, I do miss English pubs. I don't drink heavily, but I like to, to have a little chat with my friends in an English pub. And of course, in an English pub, uh, you can drink beer, and you, or you can drink wine. The wine's not so good, nothing like Georgian wine. It's not, not as nice. Or you can drink, you know, spirits or shorts, like, like gin and tonic or those sorts of things. So, I have a pub that I go to quite a bit, yeah? And the pub is in, is, is in a, I live in a small town, Hastings, and there's one pub that's over 400 years old, and it's called the Old Pump House. Pump, of course, you know, the town's Pump House, the Old Pump House. And I go there when, every time I'm in England, and we go to the pub, and I sit at a little table, and uh, I drink beer with my friends, okay? So scaffolding, I give you a context. I'm not using any difficult language in that context. I can refer to that context any number of times. I can refer to the table, I can refer to the, the building, I can refer to what you know. Then I would introduce, when I finish my beer, I ask my friend to get the next round in. I ask my friend to get the next round in because we don't have waitress or waitresses to come to the table. We need to go to the bar 
Yes. And we need to pay, because they don't trust us English people, we need to pay for each beer. So uh, he goes up, he goes and gets the round in, and that means he buys the beer or drinks for all of us on the table, and he brings them back. And then when we finish, we might, after a few too many drinks, we say, whose round is it? Whose round is it? Is it your round? No, I bought the last round. It must be your round. So scaffolding is building a context that's understandable to introduce the new language. Uh, my aim here this visit is to give an extended training program for both university lecturers and teachers of English in secondary schools. What we've been looking at is how to incorporate some of the new trends and methodologies into traditional teaching environments. Again, you need to look at affixes. If we take any word in English, any verb, let's take a verb form. How many verb forms are there? If we take any English verb, how many ways can we break it down? Any English verb has how many particles? One, two, three, four. Five. Five. Okay, so you have the infinitive. So, so for example, he will write is different from the present simple, he writes. Yeah, so the, the, the infinitive, the present simple, the Past simple, wrote. The past participle, present participle. written. And the present participle, writing. Yeah, so five, five verb forms. So we have automatically different types of verb suffixes. Yeah? Those are some simple verb suffixes. We have a regular verb. <laughs> Noun suffixes. Adjective suffixes. Adverb suffixes. What's the, what's the last one? Prefixes. Prefixes. It's sometimes useful to get students to realize how flexible English vocabulary is. Instead of learning one word, they might learn 15. Yeah, because it has the same root, the same sort of meaning. Uh, you talked about a good lesson is when the students float out of the room in love with the language. So let's take the word love. How many other words can you derive from the root Love. Love, you know, yeah. Love. Loving, loving. That's very British English, someone in the theatre. And that's the plural form. Uh, so quite often, if I'm practicing with students at higher levels, I'll say, okay, here's a word, how many words can you make? And I'll look at the affixes and we'll, we'll put them into context. I think the range of language for the participants has also been quite interesting. Uh, some of the people who have attended my courses have got a C2 level of English. They're very fluent. A lot of them have American accents. Uh, a lot of them talk about the standard of their students as being quite high. Meanwhile, I've seen some of the older teachers who've come along, who've been teaching far longer than I have, who are still passionate about teaching and still willing to learn more, which is always good to see. 
Um, during our initial session on methodology, we've covered lots of different areas and we've also looked at some of the technological advances. I think Pearson is a language leader in this area uh, with things like My English Lab, which really helps students with flexible learning and help learner autonomy uh, and enable the teacher to get a, a good, clear example of where the students are. Pearson Tests of English, that's what PTE means. Uh, the Pearson Tests of English is a six level examination. So there's slightly wider choice. The main difference between the Pearson and the general is that the speaking part is not compulsory. So if you have some students that are a little worried about the speaking part, they can take the writing part separately yeah? and get a, just get a certificate for, for the written part. So they're connected to the Common European Framework of Reference. Uh, the exam gets longer the higher the level. So the shortest exam is an hour and 15 minutes. And the longest exam is just under three hours. And I think one of the things that, that, that Pearson and LCCI, they say, if you really are a high level language learner, you have to function in that language in your company or in your university for an extended period of time. So they feel it's important that you have a long exam to show that you can function in those areas. So, uh, a1 and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, if we have a look at it, uh, you said you've mentioned you know IELTS, yeah, and you know the Cambridge examinations. Uh, you've got PTE General and PTE Academic. PTE Academic is an amazing exam, um, but you need a special center to, to, to actually take it because it's all computer assisted. What's amazing about it is that you have one candidate take an exam, and the same room, another candidate is taking the exam, it's a different exam. It's all done by computer, and it's really fancy. And it's all marked by computer, so that the marks come within 72 hours, the student knows. So it's, it's really good if you've got a student who has to prove that they, they've got an English at that level, with IELTS, they, they have to, to book in advance and, and okay, okay, there's a little bit of time. PTE Academic might be the way forward for a quick fix, and it's a nice exam. But we're going to concentrate in this session on the PTE General. So you notice we've got slightly more flexibility in the entry level. We can start below the Cambridge exams, and then we go up in a similar format. Okay? Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Move forward? Yes. Right. So, the layout of the exams is the same. So, all the written levels have nine sections. Section one, two, and three are listening. Section four to seven, reading. Eight and nine, two writing tasks. So, they're all the same. Speaking? Speaking is slightly different. For levels two to five, you have four sections. And of course, this is 75 <laughs> points, this is 25 points. So if you wanted to have a, a, a hundred. And then you don't have, you have a slightly shorter speak and spoken test for the first two levels. So they don't have part 11. <coughs> That's the only difference. But the format is fairly universal, okay? So there's either 13 sections or there's 12 sections for the first two levels. I decided to show you um, just one level because the format is similar. And when I show you one, you get the taste of the others. So this is one level. You notice 10, 20, 30, uh, 40, 50, 60, 75 points there. And the speaking is 25 points, so that's a total of 100. Uh, what you've got, as I show you, it's, it's for test takers who use an upper intermediate level of English for their personal, social, educational, working life. B2 level. I chose B2 because B2 is the first 
level that I think really means something mm -hmm. in terms of entry into to other institutions. I think it's nice for students to, to, to get success at lower levels. It's not that useful in terms of certification. Okay, so of course any book that's connected to the Common European Framework of Reference is ideal preparation for the PTE generals. Uh, Pearson have got um, sheets which show which area is divided for each part of the book for preparation. But let's have a look at it. Section one, 10 points, listening. Section one, yeah, you've got the text, and then you've got the answers to the text. They have to choose. You know this type of text. They listen and they choose. What I think is quite useful, and again, here we have in a Pearson book, listen and decide whether it's true or false. So make a choice. Transactional listening. Um, I think it's quite useful when you do this type of exam with students is to make sure that the students have an idea of what's being tested. Um, so I get them to think about distractors. So here is a question from the B2 level, yeah, the upper intermediate, Pearson Test of English, level three. This is the listening text. This is the question. What's the answer? Have a read and tell me what the answer is. Weatherman. Is he the weatherman? Okay. So. Ah, uh, yes. Or holiday maker. Okay. Now, you said weatherman. Well, people say they didn't really do Yeah, exactly. Now, weatherman would probably be a good distractor. Ah. It would probably be a good distractor, wouldn't it? Yeah? So I think it's quite useful to get the students to try and think what the good distractor would be. Okay. So a weatherman, what do you think could be another distractor? Uh, having li well, what's his job? Having listened to the weather forecast, well where do you hear the weather forecast? On the radio or on the television? So these are the two distractors. And then, of course, that's the correct answer. Yeah? I think it's a useful skill to actually get the students to look at the listening text and get the students to try and create the distractors. I think that gives them a better understanding of what's being tested. The red herrings. Okay. Zoom through, zoom through. Section two is basically a dictation exercise. A dictation exercise. It's a... Uh, They'll hear it twice. The first time they'll hear it, it will be at normal pace. Mm -hmm. The second time they'll hear it, there will be pauses to in, in order them to, to write it down. I think dictation exercises, although they seem to be a little bit old-fashioned, these are the type of skills that students actually need and use. So one of the things with Pearson and London Chamber of Commerce, you have more practical skills in the exams than sort of exam skills, if you see what I mean. And I think dictation is quite, quite useful. There are lots of different dictations you can do. I'm sure... You know what shouting dictation is? Well, let me tell you what a shouting dictation is. Teenagers mumble. In their own language. What chance do we have in English sometimes? So if I'm doing a dictation, I might have one student here, one student at the back of the class. So they have a list of them. And so actually they have to project their voices. Otherwise their partner can't hear. 
Now, sometimes the teacher in the next lecture theatre gets a little angry if it's too noisy, so you don't do it too often. But I think it's quite a good way of, of actually getting that. Uh, running dictation, well, this is for kinesthetic learners. Yeah. And of course, what you do, you have one text up here. Mm -hmm. So you have one person who runs up, Read looks, reads the, the text, run back, and then dictates to the other person. So you get a little bit of movement in, in doing it. Uh, personal dictation, let's do that now. Let's do that. Let's do a personal dictation exercise very quickly now. Are you ready? You need a piece of paper. Piece of paper. <coughs> I want you to listen to, I'm going to give you four sentences. I don't want you to write everything I say, but I will, when I, when I say the sentence, I'll make a funny word. When I make the funny word, you write down something that's true for you. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I say, my name is Laura, <laughs> it's very difficult to write, I don't know how to spell it. You'll write your name. So it's true for you. Okay? And that's all you write. You don't have to write, my name is, just the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay? Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would never spend more than uh, on a haircut. I would never spend, so you don't have to write the whole thing, just okay. the answer. I'd never spend more than <laughs> on a haircut. Write down how much money you would spend. Okay, just that. Okay. If you came home with me today, and you looked in my wardrobe, you would see that I have around mm, pairs of shoes. Around mm, pairs of shoes. Write down how many pairs of shoes you have. Around. The biggest class I have ever taught, the biggest class I have ever taught, contained around mm, students. Only one. Only one word. Around, approximately, mm, students. Okay. Last one. My oldest living relative, sister, mother, whatever, my oldest living relative is around mm, years old. Okay? You should have four numbers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Show the numbers to your partner, see if they're similar or completely different. Yeah, are your numbers? So let's have a look at numbers. 50, yeah. Okay. How long? 15, 16, 16. A minute. A minute for a haircut. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Very simply, if you personalize the dictations, if you get the students to, to write down just one piece of information, it's very easy for them to reformulate what was originally written, because it's personal for them. So you start with maybe one word or two words, and then if it's meaningful, then they can reformulate it. So that's a personal dictation. Dictation machine is basically when the students say, stop, or the students say, rewind. So it's like a tape deck. You're, you do some live listening. And so if I say, one day I was walking down the street and stop, Play, yeah. and I carry on. Yeah? yeah? And you can rewind and you go back. So so the teacher is and, and you give the power to the students. Grammar dictation, very simple. If you want to make it a little bit more interesting, uh, you give them a, a, a text, and maybe the text is in the present simple, and when they write, they have to write it in the past simple. 
Yeah? So the first word in my text is every day. The first word in their text is yesterday. Yeah? Every day I go shopping. And they would write, yesterday I went shopping. So you just make it a little bit more exciting for them. Yeah? It's understandable why. But what is the use of this one, the first one? The personal dictation. Uh, it allows them to reformulate. One of the important things with note taking is that they don't write down everything they hear, they write down one or two words. Now, if you make the words meaningful, what's important is what was the first word you wrote, first number you wrote? 20 lari. 20 lari. What was the question? Uh, to pay, so how, how, what is the maximum you'll pay for your haircut? So at the end of it, I would get them to reformulate what the actual utterance was, and they can remember because it's personalized. Yeah, so you make it more personal, and then they would write the original question. So it's like a dictation for that. Okay, section three. Again, no completion. So similar to, to the types they've been doing. Uh, and again, in the book, you've got no completion. They listen and they write the words. Uh, we're going to go through quite quickly. Section four is, you've done the three lead re listening sections. You're now on reading. You've got a multiple choice gap fill. And again, the gap fill normally focuses on the different types of words. Here's something you can see from the gap fills in the text. Sometimes with gap fills, a simple gap fill, you can just do it with a word. I do collocation circles, so I draw a circle, I think of a word, I draw circles around the, the, the center. So let's do this. This is designed for high level students. I have a word in the middle. Can you guess it? It collocates with all the words on the outside. One word. One word. Any ideas? Shop. Shop assistant, shop corner shop, shop floor for the union, shop for food, online shop, shop online, closed shop is again union shop at Tesco's. Um, some of the other things we've been doing, we've been looking at specialised courses. Increasingly now, in private language schools, uh, specialisation seems to be uh, a unique selling point. So you don't have students who want just English, but they want English for medical purposes, or English for legal purposes, or in the case of some of the courses I teach in the Czech Republic, English for science and technology. Now, luckily Pearson have got quite a few new titles that are really helpful for these specialised courses. I've been using technical English and I find that the help that gives me, someone who is a complete technophobe, in helping to prepare students who have an established background in it, very useful and rewarding. Um, legal English is another area that we've been looking at and given the fact that nowadays uh, lawyers are having to deal with international law, it's useful that we've got lots of precedents and real-life case situations in books like Legal English. My particular favourite though has to be some of the business books and we've been looking at intelligent business specifically uh, with regard to teaching pre-experienced university students and secondary school uh, classes and I think this is an ideal preparation course for students who perhaps are looking to study finance in a, in a separate university or economics or looking to get uh, into the job market. We've also been focusing on exams. Uh, we've gone through the Pearson tests of general English, uh, all five levels of them. Uh, we've looked at how to give the students some support when taking those exams. And we've also had a look at the LCCI examinations, which I believe are probably one of the most flexible business examinations on the market at the moment. Again, that's the website, lcci.org.uk. That's got a lot of free sample materials for these tests.
surplus we have to uh, basically the, the student has to answer uh, on a letter of complaint right it is the whole thing is a letter of complaint no no what you have is you have several different tasks to do in the third level i, I mean one of them. <laughs> It is the it's a transactional piece of writing. It might be. <laughs> Not necessarily a letter of complaint. That's one particular example. Yeah. So, so it's not always a letter of complaint. Yeah. So there's standards of writing. Yeah. So there's standards of writing. So. Again, if you look at it, you've got the English for Business, the level 4 distinction will give you a C2 certificate, the Beck Higher will give you a C1 certificate, yeah? If you just pass the level 4, it's C1. So it gives you, again, the Beck Vantage is just a B2 certificate. If you take the level three exam and you pass it, you get B2. If you get a distinction, you get C1. So it gives you more flexibility with where you place it. So this is the certificate. Yeah, this is the level three. You've got the name of the, the person. And because she's passed with merit on the certificate, Rather than B2, it says C1. So it's very clear for the employer which language level it is. If she just passed without merit or distinction, it would say B2. So you can get the certificate and you get the flexibility with that. So it gives you an added advantage, if you like. All right. I think that's enough for today. I'll see you tomorrow. We'll do something all in all, this has been a really rewarding experience and I've been very happy to come to Tbilisi and I'm always happy to eat Georgian food and experience Georgian hospitality. So I hope they invite me again.